and give the next generation more liberty than we were left with. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Mr. Reyes, if you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. Please be seated. I uh, recognize I don't see any uh, politicians other than Mr. Reyes. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Mr. Tony Reyes, he is our county supervisor uh, chairman, also uh, supervisor of South County. Is that correct, Tony? That's correct. All right. As I know. And, and he'll, he'll be speaking with us as soon as we get through with our opening statement. Uh, Thank you. Ms. Nancy, you want to give us our uh, mission statement? The Colorado River Tea Party mission is to attract, educate, and mobilize fellow citizens to secure public policy that stops the growth of excessive government, irresponsible spending, and runaway taxes. To help elect political representatives who are consistent with our core values and to reestablish the constitutional foundation of our country. Thank you. And for our uh, minutes, our secretary is uh, stuck in Flagstaff right now, and so is our, yes ma'am. Mr. Chairman, I would like to make a motion that is our secretary is not available tonight, or if she is, that she be suspended with those two, the minutes and the treasurer's report. There's been a motion that we suspend the secretary's report and treasurer's report because we're both at, uh, at the tonight. Yes ma'am. Second. There's been a second. Any discussion? Seeing, hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you very much. So, uh, I wasn't going to do a uh, soapbox tonight, but after last night, I got to. I got to. First of all, I want to congratulate my brother Carl. Carl comes up with ideas, and the key party is a family. We execute the ideas. And we had a rally on 24th Street and 4th Avenue supporting Donald Trump and his efforts with COVID. We also had a support for our police department chief police, Susan Smith, and also our great Sheriff Leon Wilmot. And we also had a rally to support our law enforcement, federal and state law enforcement, and of course our veterans in service. And Carl comes up with the idea. We had uh, uh, over 20 uh, personnel show up in our support. Big Wayne's there, as always. Mike, where's Mike at? Mike Richards, where are you at? Yeah. Mark Richards, yeah, he was rocking the town. He had the music. He, uh, he, uh, he had his going. The only problem was my wife was dancing so much in the street she couldn't cook dinner last night. What's up to that? So I got fat and hung good. I love it. But as always, we have a lot of, a lot of, lot of positive outreach and support of what we're doing. People are still wanting, right? They want conservative American values. They want moral values. And yes, do we have our, uh, uh, I want to say youngins. I always say, oh, we had a lot of sex on 4th Avenue, 24th Street, and people look at me, what are you talking about? A lot of FUs and a lot of this and that, and a lot of broken fingers. <laughs> <laughs> but the positive outweighed the negative, and, I, and I'm, I'm happy for that. So all you guys that were here, congratulate yourselves. Y'all did a good job. We represented Yuma real well. We did, uh, by the way, we did support our, our, our mayor, we showed support for him, he loved it. So moving right along, I want to introduce this young man over here. Yes, Tony, I'm talking about you. Uh, Tony's a great guy, South County, you know, uh, different parties, but it doesn't matter. Tony and I, we are able to talk and communicate with each other. We don't always agree, but we agree to disagree, but we do it respectfully. I wish everybody else in this country were able to talk to each other respectfully and walk away with it with I walk away from the table with dignity between both parties. Sometimes it takes a select few to mastermind that and to get it over so everybody. 
He's a board director, uh, county supervisor, also South County uh, supervisor. Another, Mr. Tony Reyes himself. Give him a hand. Thank you. Keep inviting me here. I think he wants to invite me to see what day I refuse to come, but it's not going to happen. Want to try to convert you? Yeah, but she's trying to convert me all the time, so you know you got to give him a class for that. I mean, he's been trying for a long time. But anyway, thank you very much for the invitation. And I, it's always look. I, I know some people may think uh, because I'm a politician, I have to admit that. But not all politicians are the same. I come from the old school of politicians that thought that compromise was the name that you had to get something done. Whether you like it or not, you have to respect other people's views and you have to understand that if not all of us come from the same place, but we're all trying to get to the same place, a better America. And I think that's important. So that's where I come from. I'm going to tell you a little bit, first of all, about my personal story so that you get to know me a little better. And then I'm going to open it up to questions because I know there's going to be some questions. Uh, and I know this is not a match wearing crowd and it's you know one of those situations where it might get a little difficult, but I do want you to know from the beginning that the reason I'm here is because I do respect the views. I do respect the, the, the statements you make and I think that you, in this country, everybody needs to have the right to say what they feel, how they feel and what they feel when they want to. So starting with that, I'll tell you a little bit of my story. I am an immigrant, actually. I, my, my parent, my, my father is a U.S. citizen. And, uh, but I was born in Mexico. He brought us to the United States, uh, 60 something, 68, I think. And then I became a U.S. citizen when I had a choice and I became a U.S. citizen in 1980, in 1980, in September of 1980. And the reason I did that is because when he brought me to this country, I was uh, taken in with open arms. I went to school in Gaston. I went to, I went to high school in Copa. I went to a technical college, which a lot of people don't know. I, I graduated from a technical college, air conditioning, uh, heating, and so on and so forth. And I was a journeyman for a while. I actually started the first air conditioning business in San Luis, Arizona, called Reyes Company. I don't know why, but <laughs> Reyes Company. And so I, I do understand. I've always had a fair business. I run a number in the board called Cointelevi de Stash, which started as a as a way for farm workers to get a house, to get a lot, to get a house. That was in 1982. So I've been running that organization for, I don't know, I, if I say 40 years, you're going to figure out how old I am. I started when I was two, actually. No, but I, you know, we, we started that with the idea that people needed a place to go to. And that's just not just the American dream. It is the dream of most people in the world to own a piece of land of your own, to build your own house. That's not necessarily just the ideals of one country, it's the ideals of everybody in the world that I know. So we started a nonprofit organization 40 some years ago. It, uh, it, in one way or another, it developed about maybe 55, 60% of the land mass in San Luis. We started with San Luis was like 12, 14,000 people, and it's now around 35,000 people. It's called Comité de Bienestar, which is a pretty difficult thing to translate because it sounds like a, like a California thing, you know, the Committee for Wellbeing which is how it translates. But it really, in reality, is just a nonprofit that is focused on improving the quality of life of everybody. We, we don't differentiate by age or race or ethnicity or something. We just try to make, it, make it, the, the ability to have a home uh, be available to everybody. So that's how, that's my personal story as an administrator. As a politician, though, it's a little bit different. I became a citizen in 1980, in 80, when, I think, 80, September of 80, I'm starting to get old. Uh, and ran for council uh, in 1982, got, got elected for, as a councilman, served for two years as the vice mayor of the town, and then served 10 years as the mayor of the city of San Luis when it was growing up. Uh, and I say growing up because it's, to me it's almost fully grown. It's still going through a lot of uh, growing pains. Uh, politically and otherwise, I always said that in San Luis politics was a contact sport because it, it really was tough. I know some of you that know me from way back know that uh, we were always in the news and not necessarily for good reasons. I know Carl and I had our runs in for a long time over how politics is run in San Luis. But I tell you, it, it may be different, but so are you know some of you. I mean, you have different views and you do it different ways. As long as, I felt that as long as people had a say, then we were okay. The way they did it might not be, look, I, <laughs> This is, I'm going to go on with the story, you're going to figure out why I say that. 
uh, I was the mayor there for 10 years. I, I was the vice mayor for two, mayor for 10 years. In 1996, I ran for supervisor, county supervisor in my district. I don't know if you remember Clyde Cummings, but some of you might remember Clyde Cummings and Betsy Cummings. Betsy was the chairman of the Republican Party, and Clyde was the supervisor that represented my district. My district was changing gradually. It was becoming more of an urban district. Cities were growing, Somerton was growing, San Luis was growing. And, and Clyde, he was a good guy, I, I tell you. I, mean, I don't have a bad thing to say about Clyde or Betsy. They were good Republicans. They were good people. They were just... You, they were representing an area that was gradually becoming again more urban. And I was too ignorant. Basically, I, I have to admit, I was too ignorant to know better. So I ran for county supervisor after being the mayor. <laughs> well, in 96, I lost the election. So, you know, that's how you begin. I lost the election. Uh, it feels a little bit jaded now, but I, I kind of sympathize with what's going on with President Trump because I challenged that election. I, uh, I went to court in the county to challenge that election. It was the first time that absentee voting was being used, and I felt it was being abused. Does that sound like uh, a little bit uh, like today or something? Well, that's, that's what I did. I challenged that in, in Superior Court in Yuma. Didn't get anywhere. It, you know, it was judges here ruled against me. I took it to the appellate court in the state of Arizona, and actually got a ruling in favor. They, it was taken to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court didn't, didn't take it. It was a decision that was unanimous at the appellate court. So that election was voided. Uh, and a new election was held in 1998. And that, I, I got elected in that election with about 60 some percent of the vote. So, um, and, and I give credit to Clyde and Betsy. They, they, were, they were a worthy opponent. They did everything they could. And it was just a change. You know, the guard. It was a change of times. I feel a little bit saying, bad saying it's a changing of the guard because I've been there for 22 years now. So I'm starting to feel like maybe I am the guy coming now. Uh, you know, been there a long time and I'm sure that somebody young like Mr. Snyder is probably thinking, well, you know, it's about time uh, there's some change. And, and I do understand that. I, you don't want to, to be the first elected of anything and then remain there forever. I mean, I do understand that feeling. Uh, but anyway, I got elected in 1998 to re representing District 4, which has changed over time. Every time there is a 10-year census, the lines are drawn differently. So in my time when I got elected, Summerton was in my district, San Luis was in my district, all the Cocoa tracks were in my district, most of the land mass from Avenue C to the west was in my district, and everything from, I think, 14 to the south was in my district, and almost everything up to the Fulio was in my district when I started as a supervisor. That was my district. It was one of the largest districts, one of the biggest districts in the county. Now, um, I got elected, I said, in 98. I got re-elected in 2004. You know, that story. I got, I've been re-elected every time. Um, uh, I'm not saying that uh, I fit every mold. I don't. I'm not saying that I am the best there is. I'm not. I'm just saying that I found a way, I think, to represent my district in a way that they can elect me, re-elect me. So the way things get done are different, uh, but I think most of us come from the same mold. We all want to do the best we can for the people who represent. The big difference is that in 2001, uh, I, I served my first term as chairman to the board. Uh, after finding out that becoming a voter supervisor was a thankless job, when you're the mayor, everybody thinks you're you know, really powerful, that you can do things. But when you're a supervisor, lo and behold, you really can't do much. I know that most people you know, consider there is actually, what is it, municipal, uh, state, and federal. Most people really see government as what happens at a municipal level and what really happens at the state level and the federal level. Most people don't really know what the county does, other than you know, they collect taxes and assess taxes, right? And you know, you do have, you do know that we do. The county actually is about 27 departments. I say about because I, I, I'm not sure that we haven't had one extra one there somewhere. 27 departments is about between, yeah, close to 1,500 people work for the county. That's, you know, public works, that's the health department, that's all the departments the county has. So it is really a big, uh, a big, big, big government in a way. But at the same time, it is designed to deal with mostly rural issues. We don't have water systems. We don't handle sewer systems. We don't do street lights. We don't do the kind of things that people want from the government who live in an urban area. And that's the problem that we face all the time. People go out to the county because they want to get away from the taxes and the fees from city government. 
And then they end up living in an area where they want those things. They want better streets, they want police services, they want sewer, they want water. We understand that, the county does. But we're also very, very dependent on what the state tells us to do. This is probably the section of government that most it's most limited. When you're a city, when you're a city government, normally you can do almost anything that you can pass a law on that hasn't been prohibited by the state. When you're a county government, you can only do what the state has approved. Basically, it has to be on statute. If it's not on statute, you can't do it. We couldn't even pass a dog parking ordinance at one point in time because the state hadn't approved us doing that. So when you talk about taxes, we do set the tax rate. But just what? The property tax rate. Normally, when you get your tax bills, there's like 10 or 12 different you know, bills, I mean, different uh, line items. Most of those line items are your school districts. Most of those line items are the, uh, the improvement districts. Most of those items we have very little to do other than to simply get what they send us, approve what they send us, and have the assessor collect them. I mean, that doesn't make you very popular. Um, we haven't raised property taxes in terms of the rates for a long time, I think for the last five or six years, because we really haven't needed to. In reality, most of the tax revenues are derived from the increase in value of your homes. In case you didn't know that, that is really how budgets keep going up. Because I, I heard your mission statement. And I heard you talk about you know keeping costs down and doing those kind of you know look at politicians, see how they raise your taxes and so forth. Most of us are pretty are keenly aware of that. Taxes are a bad word for almost any politician that I know of that serves in the county board of supervisors doesn't really want to talk about taxes. Uh, and, and they're right. Uh, it, it's something that people feel you know that you're being forced to. You're, you're not. At the county level, you're not. At the county level, you do have a board of supervisor members that are keenly aware that taxes is a thing that you, well, that not only taxes, I, this is not a high square crowd, as I can tell, so I know you have other issues that you feel strongly about. But in, in, in essence, that's probably the biggest issue that we deal with uh, in terms of what we do as supervisors. We approve a budget, a budget of about Two hundred seventy million dollars, including all the improvement districts. So we do have a quote large budget. We're larger than the city of Yuma. We're larger than any other entity. It's just that we work in an area that most people, and, and I like it that way. I personally tell you, I like it that way. I like it that most people that feel the impact of government don't really feel the impact of county government. And as you mentioned earlier, when you do, like the local county sheriff, they're mostly Republicans anyway. In this county, although we have a very split type uh, registration between Democrats and Republicans, most of county government is run by Republicans. Uh, if, you know, you, you look at the recorders in Republican. You look at now the assessors are Republican, and you, you you see you look around the sheriffs are Republican. The only thing that right now isn't Republican, I should be planting this seed, is the board of supervisors. The majority of the board of supervisors. As of uh, five years ago, it's been, uh, it's been Democrat. But it's been a centrist Democrat. You know, we don't really, I don't think we deal, we don't get to deal with most of the issues that have an impact on everyday life. We don't deal with legislation, let's put it that way. We're mostly an administrator uh, function. We administer a budget. We meet twice a month on Mondays by law, by statute, and then we meet for work sessions whenever work sessions are needed. Uh, we're probably the most overpaid politicians in the, well, the county, for sure. You know, they, they really pay us well. I mean, I, I, I was making $500 a month when I was mayor. I'm not even going to say how much I make a month now as a supervisor because it's almost offensive. We don't do that much work. Seriously. I mean, we're great. We agree. Yeah, we're great. Yeah. I think you agree. I think you agree. Uh, and it, 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 look, I, that's one of the things that I like most about myself. I, I don't mind admitting the truth. The truth is the truth, whether you like it or not. So it doesn't, you know, I, when I got elected as supervisor, I was actually, a, I was actually a little, you know, can I say this word right? I was a little dumb and stupid. <laughs> I actually believed that we had more power than we actually do. We're not, we're not able to pass ordinances, create laws. We're not able to change many things. We're only mostly an administrative arm of the state. So we do run the health department, uh, we do run the libraries, they're all in, in, in districts, we do have flood control, we do manage a lot of stuff, but it's not necessarily stuff that you get to see all the time. Well, you're a county resident, you're off, you're mostly in the booking, you do have, this is your government, actually, I should have, I should have remembered that. The crowd that I'm talking to, I'm probably
probably mostly uh, rural in nature. I mean, you do live in the foothills and you refuse to be annexed by the city of Yuma for as long as I can remember. So I, I suppose if there's a rebel crowd, this is it. Uh, and again, uh, I appreciate that. I, I, although I'm an immigrant and I became a citizen, I did it by choice. I, I didn't do it because I was born here. I chose to be a citizen of this country and I chose to give back to it as much as I could. And that sounds a little corny, but it's true to me. That's how I felt then, and that's how I feel now. Um, it, I, I consider it a great opportunity to be the chairman in difficult times. If you think about it, 2001 was when 9-11 happened. So I went through that as a chairman of the board, and now I'm back again with the pandemic and another crisis mode. For those of you who don't know how a mass mandate is established, it, it was established by the board. So. Don't blame the rest of the board. The rest of the board didn't pass a proclamation, an emergency proclamation. It was me. It was me. I passed the emergency proclamation that set down the, the structure or the mandate, as we call it, to wear a mask. But I can tell you right now, you probably also read that the sheriff said I'm not going to enforce it. Right? Mm -hmm. So in reality, it, it was more of a suggestion that is a little stronger than a suggestion. I think the governor wasn't gutsy enough to make the decision, so he said, why don't you guys make it yourself, and then I don't have to, I can avoid saying that I did it. But in reality, he could have stopped us. Because he, he, he could have made it a policy, you guys don't do more than I do, don't restrict more than I do, which he does. He is, in all, in all essence, the chief officer of the state of Arizona, and he can basically tell us, remove it. I don't think he does it because, well, whatever. I'm not going to speculate why he doesn't do it. It's, you know, it's in the end of his term, so whatever he decides, we have to live with. But anyway, look, I look, I'm starting to run along. Uh, I, I know that you're going to be wanting to ask some questions. I tried to get that mask thing out as soon as I could, because I know that's one of the questions I'm going to get. So, you know, um, I think that you know enough about me personally now to, to, to put a face to that name, you know, when you hear Tony Reyes. Um, it is true, I am from South County, it is true, I'm an immigrant, uh, but it's also true that I've invested most of my life in doing things for other people. And I think that sort of, sort of makes me feel good, and I think that's why I can, I can face any crowd and say, no, I, I understand where you're coming from, I do. Uh, I understand your positions, I do, I do understand it. What I want to make is the point. The point is, the fact that we don't agree doesn't mean we don't understand each other. At least in my perspective, I do understand. We don't, we don't agree on some things, but we, we agree on the most important thing. This is the greatest country in the world, and we should all feel lucky that we're here. And no matter what else we believe, and no matter how different we are, we're still members of this particular country, and we should all be proud of that. And we should all work to make it better, in, in, in our own way. And I'm trying to do it my way, and I hope that there's a point where we can we can do it our way, and and again with all due respect, I, I I'm here in front of you. I will answer every question that you ask me as truthfully as I can, if I don't run out before. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I got me to stay here, so I can't run out. Who's going to protect you? No, look, I know I know, we're we're talking, we're talking. I know a lot of people. I don't feel that's the way we get along with each other. We make this we I respect Carl ever since I met him. I know we, you know, we butt heads all the time. That's why he's Bob and I'm Bob. But <laughs> other than that, you know, we all right. don't check. Let's get to the first question. Who has the first question? Don't make me have the first question. No. Yeah. All right, have. I got the first question. No, no. Right over here, Carl. Let's jump. Right here, sir. You mentioned what? How much your budget is? Where does? That budget get established. How is that established? Okay, the budget is actually only about seventy four million dollars in the general budget. That's what we actually manage. The rest of it is mostly school districts, improvement districts. Uh, most of it is uh, fund. It, it's money that's channeled through the county, but it really isn't under our control. You see, you if, if you need, if I can explain uh, budgeting, um, there's only. We can only manage the money that we collect for, for example, if we if we collect for the library, we have to spend the money on the library. If we collect for the for the flood control district, we have to spend the money on flood control. We can't shift and put money in different places. So the in that money, the sixty-four million dollars is a combination of state state and federal money. 
we get money, for example, from the federal government for, for a program we call PIL, which is payment in lieu of, in, in lieu of taxes which basically pay us for all. Yuma County, for those of you who don't know, it's only about 11% uh, privately held. The rest of it is federal, it's federal land, or it's state or federal land. So we really don't get tax revenues for, for about 89% of the property in Yuma County, because it isn't really property, it's more federal land. Uh, it's uh, something weird about this. This is one of the largest counties, it's about, I think it's a fifth largest county in the state in terms of budget, in terms of population. But in reality, it is almost 90% federal. So we do get money from the federal government to handle or to handle the federal land or to, or to, I call it, I said it, in lieu of being able to collect taxes on the property, they send us a certain amount. The state sends us the amount they collect the taxes that are allocated to the, uh, to the, to the county. And then we get revenues from different sources. It's, it's a big budget, and it's a combined budget, but we really only manage about 64, 65 million. Okay, we got another question back right there. You said uh, that you you are in control of the health as well? When I say in control, I think I'm overstating that. We do manage the budget for the health department. We do have some say on how the health department is run. It is run by a director, his own director, Mrs. Gomez, Diana Gomez, but we can as a board of supervisors, we can set some policies out. For example, i just give you an example. This issue with the pandemic and the vaccines is a prime example. The health department runs by itself, but when the complaint comes over, they normally complain to us, to the, to the board of supervisors. Either they can't get in the website, or they can't make an appointment, or they can't get a vaccine. So we do have some authority, and it's normally a budget authority. Unfortunately for us, that is really being supplanted by the federal government and state government because they're sending so much money to the health department, directly to the health department, that it's become almost uh, an entity of its own. They have, they, they're getting lots of money to do this. Uh, and so it's... In one it's, it's, aspect, I know that working with the health department, you're also working with CDC, correct? No, well, CDC is a federal agency. Right. They do have, they do provide guidelines, but they don't provide management. Okay, when it comes to the mask, because I am like, I am, I, I'll fight you on masks. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it, you're not the only one. <laughs> when it comes to wearing a mask and being able to go into different places because you don't have a mask on, I find it highly offensive for me because, for one, I can't wear one. Right. Although, I, even if, if I didn't have to wear one, I, I still do. Um, when you go into places and they tell you, you can't come in unless you have a mask on, we're all wearing masks out there, and I feel as though we're conforming, and we are also um, being complacent with a government that is pushing their policies off on us that we don't want. Well, that and, and, it, and it's hurting, it's hurting our environment, it's hurting people, it, mm -hmm. it is actually hurting um, our businesses mm -hmm. and our restaurants mm -hmm. and it's closing down places where people can't do what they need to do. I tend to agree, but there is 535,000 reasons why no, we right. always look at that. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. I say I, I agree that it's limiting your rights as an individual, mm -hmm. but your right, the rights of the community itself are a different story. <laughs> now, this is a group that bases the policies on the rights of every individual and the liberty and the, and the ability to choose. But this is not to me. And again, we, we just tend to, I, I tend to agree that what you are asking for is the basis for everything. I tend to agree with that. But this is not a political or a choice that we make based on politics and so forth, even though it's been made that way. This is a health decision. This is a, this is a pandemic. This is not a political statement on my part or a political statement in your part. This is, this is driven by deaths, driven by impact. We, you know, what can I say? We, if we didn't have anybody die from this thing, I don't think we would be talking. I think we would be saying, okay, well then don't wear anything that you want to, but you don't wear a mask to protect yourself only. You wear a mask to protect other people. So yes, you do have a right not to wear it as far as I'm concerned. As far as I'm concerned, the policy that we made is still a, a much, as much of a choice. But the, but the businesses that are following that, in, that mandate, really are just needing, they just need an excuse to do it. If they don't want to do it, 
I don't think we have an enforcement policy on this. I don't remember anyone in Yuma County, any business in Yuma County that's been cited for not requiring people to wear a mask. I do. You do? Yeah. We well, do. I don't. We do. We do. Okay, moving right along, <laughs> we're, we're going to kill this thing on the mask. Yeah, yeah. I knew it. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm in charge. Inside. I'm in charge. Okay, yeah. sir. Okay? Go ahead. There was a gentleman back there who was up before you were. Right. Have <laughs> him back from this. Go ahead, go ahead. He's giving his way to you. John. 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 He's giving his way to you. Go ahead. He's giving it to you. He's giving it to you. Well, just a moment, anyways. Why are decisions and policies made on bad science? Now, I know statistics, I know science. Time out, time out, time out. Okay, I'm going to find one. Yeah, he's not going to tell you my phone. Yeah, you're my phone. That's fine. Okay, now you're on. Why are policies made on bad science? Starting from the top. I know it's bad science. I study statistics, I know numbers. It's bad science, bad record keeping, and that should not affect my liberty and my pursuit of happiness mm -hmm. because of bad science. So I quote the doctor up there. Okay. I know science, don't I? <laughs> okay. uh, whether it's good science or bad science. No, it's bad. Uh, okay, but, yeah. <laughs> whether it's good but, but when it's bad science or not, it, it's, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's, I mean, look, it's not just an opinion. I do understand this is deeper than that. I do understand it's a position that people take. Uh, with, you know, I do understand people say, well, it's my body and I can basically do anything I want to with it because the impact of what I do is you want to impact me. But that is not necessarily the case with this thing. This thing is not predicated on the individuals. People who suffer, I, I have COVID. And I know Carl had COVID. Oh, yeah. I know some other people had COVID. Oh, yeah. And some people didn't have much happen to them. <laughs> yeah, they lost a sense of taste or smell. Uh -huh. I had pneumonia for two weeks. Uh, other people have nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, some people went mm -hmm. through, my, my father in law died from COVID. Mm -hmm. So there's a different experience for everybody with this thing. That's what makes it so difficult, right? Mm -hmm. All of us live through a different, <laughs> this, this virus doesn't do the same thing to everyone. So when, when some people say it's bad science and you get it, <laughs> Then it's good science, right? I mean, it's true. It, it really is. Yeah. And when people go through it with no impact at all, uh, people can say what they want to say because I think in reality, yeah. unless you live in, look, I'm not going to hide uh, behind the fact that I had COVID. I made that decision way before, you know, I had COVID. So, yes. Why do people make decisions based on bad science? Because we don't think it's bad science, right? We think it's good science. So, so I'm, I'm sorry. Really uh -huh. am that this is, this has become a situation where we started to define which is good science and which is bad science, and I know that most of you, if not all of you, uh, think that that decision was the wrong decision. I agree. I agree with you in that respect because it affects you that way. But the decision wasn't made for just a group or just a you know segment of society. It was made for all society. And, and like I said, I I understand that they, I understand where you're coming from. I do. Uh, it's just that when I had to make, take all these things into consideration, I, I decided to do it that way. And, okay. and I know it's not popular. Okay, let's move on because we can kill this. Okay, hang on a minute. If, if it's something else other than masks, because we can be here 24 7 on masks. Yeah. There's other issues hey, out there. But let me just finish this. I, no, I, this, this is no way to, to, to say something as a politician that promises, right? But I will take a look at the mask mandate soon. And I will take into consideration what you've said. I don't promise you that. I will do that. Okay, so the likelihood of this continuing much longer is, what's this thing to almost not? Because I think we're getting to a point now where whether it's bad science or good science, it's not going to really matter that much. It's going to be an issue now that people have said in the ways about whether they wear it or not. And it really doesn't make any difference. What I say to people is what they believe. And if you don't believe in what I what we say or what we ask for. It's like, to me, it's like it's like speed signs, right? I mean, if you put a speed sign that says 60 miles an hour in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> most people are just going to ignore it. It's in the middle of nowhere. But if you put a speed sign in a place that makes sense, uh, you, you, you guys wear seat belts, right? And that's an infringement on your rights. If you yes. want to die in an accident, that's, you know, you're probably, you would say. Okay, but, Tony, we got many more questions to go. We got more questions to go. What, what was your question, sir? Yeah. If I understand correctly, 
Okay, if I understood you correctly, you said you were unaware of the health department shutting down any business due to masks. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware that the health department shut down. I, I, won't make, I won't take the time here, but after the meeting, I'll give you three. All right, so, so uh, I can too. Oh. Jim, do you have a question? <laughs> Well, I, I've got four different studies from uh, people from uh, studies from all around the world that you say that masks do not work. All right, from CDC, from, from uh, uh, countries from all around the world, and also whenever you go get your COVID test, it's a coronavirus test. It's not testing you for COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. a, a coronavirus is all flu, mm -hmm. all flus. That's why you'll hear on the news that there's no seasonal flu because they're all calling it COVID-19 because they don't get paid for influenza. Right, right. And all those deaths, even CDC's uh, numbers back in back in October, from the own CDC's uh, people saying that only six percent of the people that died, which was about 120,000 people at the time, only six percent of the people. And I know for a fact that a lot of these deaths are not COVID-19 themselves. That's right. Yep. Yep. There's stories going all around the internet yep. From, yep. From, from people that work in medical and uh, morgues and stuff like that. And they're being told if a body comes in, no matter how they die, test them. If they test positive for COVID, we'll list it as a COVID death. Doctors are paid 20% <laughs> extra throughout the United that. States. <laughs> to list as a COVID-19 deaths because it's a money bag for, for the doctors. So you need to look into the numbers seriously. A lot of the reason though, a lot of these mass mandates throughout the United States is, it's a, it's a babysitter for, so people don't feel so bad. Let me put something over your mouth and it shows how, it, how it's affecting kids, how it's affecting infants with socialization because they can't tell how because they read people's faces and kids. Okay. You got kids, you got more people in California that they see with psychological and attempted suicide than they do have with people actually dying from COVID. Right. The whole thing is just a, a, a big farce. It was a pandemic. Yes. I'm not saying it wasn't out there, but there's a lot of misinformation going out because it's all about control. It's not about safety. That's a lie. It's about control. And right. yeah. So I'm going to go on. Yes. Yes. I'm going to go one more step when we talk about that we talk about and with the questions that we ask in, in public is uh, I always mix up on the name hydrochloric. Okay, we know we know it's on it's on the books. It was working, but our governor banned it from the state for being used. When in our history, our American history, has anyone banned a drug that could possibly work? Mm -hmm. This is the first time I've seen it in history, and it was working. I know our own people here in the Tea Party that had it, went to Agamemnon's, and they got the drug, hydrocodone, and it worked for them. But our, our government you, banned it. You have to take the zinc with the hydroxychloroquine. Right. Because that was their study. Yeah, that yeah. hydroxychloroquine yeah. didn't work alone. It has one you zinc. And that's one of the things, that's why we're, we question so time. Because we, we, we know that it was working, but the governor banned the drug, and it turned out the governor is on the board of one of the companies that was buying for the antidote for the coronavirus. That's why we're, we're suspicious of all this stuff. But enough of the coronaviruses uh, and the mask. Uh, I want to start the new question round with this one. With all, with all the flux of the immigrants for citizenship, uh, with all the, the happening with the illegal immigrants coming in, but now they're not called illegal immigrants, they're called migrants. Back in my day, a migrant was a worker that came across the table. Uh, all right, they changed. My question to you, uh, Tony, because you're, you're in the know, and I respect you. And I hope you have my answer for this. All the people that have been paying thousands and thousands of dollars to get here illegally, that have been waiting for the paperwork to be finished, are all these people that are coming in America illegally with the blessings of a commander in chief, are all those people that have been on there, they're going to be cut, are these people going to cut in line and they're going to have to wait again? The president is wrong. The president Biden is wrong. Right away. I mean, you don't, 
he doesn't understand. The voter is particularly different, right? When you're saying, uh, don't send us your kid, but you're saying we're going to take him in, all they hear is we're going to take him in. Yeah. They don't hear don't send them. Yeah. They hear if you send them, we'll take them in. That is not a policy that makes any sense to me. I've lived on the border for years, and I know that every time you say something, even if it's your good intention or well intentioned, and he is well intentioned, you know, he's trying, but he, he's making a mistake. That is not a policy that's going to work. First. Second, a lot of people who've been waiting for a year or two years to get their cases heard that are waiting someplace else do not deserve to be in the back of the line. Right. They deserve, okay. we in America don't do that. We don't jump in front of people in the vaccine line. We don't jump in front of people at the cross street line. Exactly. We should be respectful of that. And, and I, I, I disagree. I disagree with, with the policies that are being implemented right now. I do believe that there's a humane way to, I believe this nation was built on a lot of immigrants. You know, they could have been Polish, they could have been Irish, they could have been Italians, they could have been anything. But everybody that came in the country, I am a legal immigrant. I, I, my, my father brought me to the country the right way. So I do want to say that there's a difference between legal and illegal immigration. Uh, uh, illegal immigration is what, you, what we should be doing. Uh, not fostering more illegal immigration. I did not agree with President Trump that building a wall was going to stop it, but I do agree that building a wall slowed it down. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so there is some, there is some, there's some good things about certain policies. And I, I, I want to say something that is going to get me in trouble with my Democrat friends. But I, I agree with President Trump most time, more time than I disagree with him. Yay. And, yes. and, the, and the, so fact right. is, the fact is, he, he did, he, his, his, I don't know his heart was, but his mind was in the right place. He, he, he understood that there's a greatness to this country that has to yes. be protect, protected in nature. And, and that, I believe, I was one of the bad things that I could think that he was making decisions. At least he was making decisions for the right reasons, right? Yeah. I mean, and sometimes, and that's why I want to emphasize to you, I may be making the wrong decision, but I'm doing it for the right reasons. I am not trying to come up with something that's going to cut your liberties or do anything to you that is negative, whether it's whether it's wearing a mask that you could or shouldn't or do, shouldn't, that, that is, and I'm not going to get back to that. <laughs> no, but, well, but uh, here's what I'm getting at. We're talking about immigration. Uh, there, there is a difference between a migrant hard worker or an immigrant and the people that are showing up. The people that are showing up are mostly asylum seekers. People that are being released in the community are being released with the tacit approval of the government. They have papers to be here. They're not illegal immigrants anymore. They're people in line to get their cases heard. So I do want to make I do want to make the point that the people that you're hearing about, the Brazilian people, the Cuban people that are showing up at this places in Summerton to be picked up and taken on a bus to to Phoenix or Tucson or, or Coachella, they're people that are allowed. They're, I asked that question from the chief of the border patrol, Glenn. I actually physically asked him, "Are you releasing anybody that shouldn't be here to this to this?" operations because we certainly don't want to support anyone that's here illegally to get to where they're going. No, 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 no. Those people that are, are asylum seekers or have a fear of going back to the country, this country is always taking a this this error on the right side. But this is not the right side. This is this is creating a situation that we're gonna pay for. And I, I don't agree with that. I think that there's other ways to do it. There's better ways to do it. We should be all looking at solving this immigration problem the right way. And that is to agree, Republicans and Democrats, to agree on some way to deal with this particular issue that isn't a uh, mad dash to the border, which is what's happening right now. Okay? Bye. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you and the County Board of Health for prioritizing a lot of the migrants that are coming over here to get the shots. That's addressing the problem that is very easy to take care of. My question is, the Department of Health, since this began back in the last year in February, the only news they put out is doom and gloom. They don't report mild cases. You ask them about contact tracing, yes. they say, yeah, we're doing it, but you never hear any information as to where it's going, how it's getting there, and how they're addressing it. All you want to hear is, no, it's going to be more cases. I don't know how much direction you can give the County Board of Health, 
But if you look at the TV news here in this town, all they do is negative. And I think that's coming directly from the health. I think that you need to take a look at those numbers and take what you see and what you hear from them carefully. I mean, most of the stuff that's out, and I do agree, for every position that somebody takes, there's a common position. The good news that I want to give you is that over 70,000 vaccines have been put into people's arms in Yuma County. That is double the number, almost, of what's been put on people in Imperial County. That's California. And in that, the county health department is as follow those guidelines from the state that basically say vaccinate people 65 and over first. So the majority of those people that have been vaccinated are either 55 and over, or police officers, or you know, customs officers, people that that are first responders got the vaccine first, and then people 65 age and older. That was followed. So, and, and I think it's in, in a way that is what resulted in the drop, the drastic drop in the cases that are being reported right now of people t- turning up positive. I mean, we've had a couple of days in the last couple of weeks that we had zero reported cases, which is, you know, we're going back to last year before we had a day that had zero reported cases. I do understand <laughs> that that is because a lot of us already got the COVID, right? So, you know, on top of the vaccination numbers, there's the people who already had the COVID and have the antibodies on their bodies already, so they can't get it again in a, in a, in a few months. But essentially, you know, I didn't want to take a long time. The good news is that the, the, we don't have a county board of health, right? Let's begin with that. What we have is a health department that's run by a director and a county board of supervisors that basically has a bit of control over what the health department does. But they're, they're a semi-autonomous department. They do certain things because if you let government run things, to be honest with you, it will take forever. So it's good that some departments run on their own because if they allowed us to make decisions every two weeks, you know, we'd be we'd be in deeper trouble than we are right now. And I don't I don't want to argue about how much trouble we're in right now because that's kind of like everybody's different opinion. But the county health department is as much as possible trying to follow guidelines. And when the lady behind mentioned CDC, uh, it's CDC sends the guidelines, but they're just guidelines. The, the state the state who sends the vaccine though really has the management tool. They will send as many vaccines. If a if a if a partner or you know if a if a pharmacy does not report the use of that vaccine within 24 hours, the state can hold back sending them more. So th- there are some checks and balances in there that are forcing this. I mean, you, you, you all, if you live in the foothills, you have a lot more options. You can go to uh, Albertson uh, Fries, you can go to the hospital, you can go to the, there's sometimes uh, clinics at the Civic Center, there are hospital clinics. Mm-hmm. So the, the thing is, I, I think we're gonna get to a point that the people who want it can get it, and the people who don't want it don't have to, because essentially everybody else got it, and so, we're going to get to that point. Moving right along, Carl. Tony, I want to say thank you for coming and talking to us tonight. And my question is, Harvest Prep is a privately owned school. They have went through this whole thing. We didn't hear you, Carl. Did you say the first time? We are, Harvest Prep is a privately owned school. They've been running all this time. All the rest of the schools have been shut down. All of the preschools, they're privately owned, and they haven't been shut down. How about the rest of our schools? Carl, if it was up to me, all schools would be open. That's my position. Whose job is it then? Uh, we, we don't control that. that. The schools were closed by the school board that run those schools. If you have something to say about how they run them, you should go to the school board meeting. Yeah. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's not the Board of Supervisors. We yeah. didn't shut down the schools. That's right. You know, you gotta go to the, the, you gotta go yeah. school board and tell them, look, uh, we don't think that's, that's proper. Right. You guys need to have a majority. Uh, there are enough, and I feel that, there are enough tools right now available to private and non private uh, public schools to be able to handle this without shutting it down. <coughs> I mean, I, that's my position. And I, and I, you guys are going to notice I'm the closest thing to a Republican we got there anyway. 
<laughs> you know, that's why you know he keeps insisting I you know, join the party. But you know, you know uh, but it, it, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that our schools are closed or were closed. I, I don't, I don't think that the science behind it was good. <laughs> so. Yeah. April? 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 April. Right, right here. Right here. I understand the state sets your salary. Yes. 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 It's mandated by the state. Okay. Is that the legislator? Yes. The legislature? Yes. Uh, but that was done like 20 years ago. Yeah. We haven't had a, an increase in, well, the, the years have been there 22 years. I, I think we had one increase. Uh, which again, I insist, it was too much to begin with. So it, it's, you know, but you have to, you have, well, you don't have to remember anything. I need to tell you that the, that the pay is the same in, in all kind of counties. So you have Parker, um, uh, what is it called, um, La Paz County, who has, they have 30,000 people. They get paid the same as a county supervisor in Yuma, the same as a county supervisor in Comodino, the same as a county supervisor in, no, Maricopa, I think, get paid a little more. But that, that's legislature. You know, there's another state called sure. Maricopa State. And so they make their own sort of decisions and their own laws over there. Yeah. Isn't think, this a big expenditure of yeah. our state tax money? Yeah, but you're talking, you're talking to the wrong people because we don't do that. We can't. We can't. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess we could return the funds. <laughs> but you know that's gonna be tough. Uh, we got used to it. Does anybody else know how much you get paid? Well, I a year? Was, I was asked that question at one time. You know, that's my answer. I was I know. asked a question that time, and, and I said, look, people get what they pay for, but they are, there's also the other side of that. People should force people to pay that much to deliver. Yes. Okay? You get paid that's more different. than our mayor. Yes. Yeah, I know. And, and we're going personal. Uh, okay. We're, 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 we're going personal now. We don't do personal here. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Look, I, I, I knew coming in here. I was going to get some tough questions. I think the mayor is useless anyway, but that's another opinion. Uh, so, we find the other mayor. Let's not get personal. You, the mayor and I don't necessarily see eye to eye, but no, I do respect him. I'm just kidding. Uh, I shouldn't kid about that because then he gets around and Tony said that. But I didn't mean it that way. What I mean is he does his job the best he can. Decisions are made that are good or bad. Uh, I think that you guys, it's almost to the point that I believe you, you should pay for less government, not more government. Yeah. So yeah. In a sense, essentially, the, more, the less we do, the better off you are. Yeah. So pay us not to do anything. It, it, it's probably less expensive. <laughs> Sally? We got Sally? We got Sally, then we got Jim. Hi, hi. Tony? Um, I have just a request to ask if you would explain to us why and how how it's going. Um, we are seeing that there's going to be a new hospital put in Yuma, and I'd like to know how many people in the room have heard about that. And uh, please tell us what if you're All right. involved. I, we're not particularly in the loop with you know the new hospitals coming in. We do know it's a hospital, I think, out of Texas. It's a company out of Texas, and it's a, a, a private company that's building hospitals throughout the country, mostly focused in some areas like this, that basically shows some potential, I guess. You know, you obviously, obviously there is a need for another hospital. There's a need for more competition. Oh, excuse me, that's right. There's a need for more competition. Competition is good for the country. Uh, you know, people should compete. You know, having a monopoly like one hospital that takes over every practice in town. I mean, if you haven't noticed, the hospital, the hospital, the hospital, the hospital, that's how they control the prices. If you go, if you get a, see, if you go to a hospital and get an aspirin and it's fifty-five dollars or something, like that, we we should all say that's stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, that is yeah. not normal. So, competition from another hospital coming into town, I think, will help. So, we should all be. I mean, I don't know. All of us may not be. I mean, some of us may be grateful that we went to the hospital and got out of our lives and we paid the bill. So I'm not going to go that far saying that all of us should support a new hospital coming. But most of us who support the free enterprise system should know that competition is good. And it's better when more than one people compete for your, well, not your services, obviously, but your, your patronage. So it's good. It's, it's good that another hospital is coming. In San Luis, they're building a medical clinic, it's a $25 million project. Uh, they're in San Luis, Arizona, in the city of Jimenez. That's, that's what, through the Western Regional Border Health, and I, I think it's great. I think the more places you have to go to have your needs taken care of, the better off will be. 
Good. Jim? Good. Would the county support a Second Amendment sanctuary county? I don't think so. There's so many Democrats on that board. Oh, wow. um, you know, it's, it's the truth. You, you want me to say something different? I don't think so. Uh -huh. I don't think we want to get into a situation we don't have to. That is not something we run or control. We can say that, and we can say anything we want to, but we don't have the power to make that change. That's in the Constitution already anyway. So what's the point here? What we're doing is saying, oh, well, we need to follow the Constitution. The Constitution pr protects the Second Amendment right. Well, right now, these counties or cities or towns. We or know people. that, but the people in Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's the no, but the, the question. Few people in Washington, D.C. We're, ta we're talking about this government. Because, well, well, what i like to know, how you personally, would you support or oppose the Second Amendment? I don't like to take positions I don't need to. Uh, I don't think this is a question that deserves an answer. Yes, I support the Second Amendment, right? Will I make that a mandate in the, in the county? I, I think you guys are tired of mandates. You just had a mass mandate, you didn't like it. So when would I make a mandate to force people to deal with something that I don't need to? Really, honestly, I don't need, we don't need in the county to take a stand that is just a stand. We, we should be able to do something. Yeah, I would agree, we need to do something, but they're gonna stand on something where you don't have any power to make any changes, just plain politics. And you guys know that pretty but well. If, if the feds pass these gun grabbing, gun control measures, would you, as a county supervisor, mandate the sheriff to enforce those laws? Even I can't you know? mandate the sheriff to do anything. Did you notice? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, he's a you. He doesn't feel we can tell him anything. No. He doesn't. I mean, yeah, I know Sheriff Wilma, I knew Sheriff Ogden, I knew Sheriff Phipps, and most of them don't, you know, there's a, there's a separation. <laughs> they don't, they're all elected officials. It's elected. Right? It's elected, right? So we mm -hmm. really have, we control the budget, and that's how we can gain some control. But the mayor, I mean the mayor, sorry, uh, the, the, the sheriff beats me up at the board meeting by telling me we need more, uh, you know, patrol. If I deny him anything, he's going to come to you all and say, well, he's not giving me that. And so I, I know I know political fights. I'm not going to win one with that guy. Uh, if there is a mandate from the state that mandates something he doesn't want to do, he won't do it. Even if I tell him to, he won't do it. So and I, I, I'm okay with the fact. You, you elect those people, right? Yeah, uh, right. They represent right. something that you want, right? Mm -hmm. And so I respect that, and I said that, and I mean that. I mean, when he came out and said, I'm not going to enforce the mask mandate, I could have made it a big fuss. I could have said, well, you have to, because it's no. my... But there's no point in doing that. That's another position that I really felt useless to take. I, I do admit it's not a perfect one, and I didn't make a perfect decision. I do admit that. I, every once in a while, I find myself, I wonder, you know, did I do the right thing? But I, have to, I, I felt I had to do something, so I did Let's not get into that one, okay? Well, change the subject a little bit. Yes. Uh, taxes. Who? <laughs> <laughs> taxes. Right. So what are taxes? Why? Are they the, those people you call to take you someplace? <laughs> because we can talk about that. No, I'm just kidding. My question is this: uh, Why is it that a resident of Yuma County uh, that uh, pays less property tax than a non-resident? That's here in Yuma County that owns property. I, why, what, why is that? I, I don't. I think no. There was a difference. I, I think taxes are assessed based on property value, and the owner pays it. If it's a resident or not a resident, a I resident, don't know. a resident of Yuma County uh -huh. pays less taxes than a non-resident property tax than a non-resident that owns property here in Yuma. Well, it may be, I, I don't, I mean, I, look, to be honest, I've asked that question I, before and nobody can answer that. Like, that's because that. most of us are ignorant of that. If I, I, can, I can always, I can ask. I mean, I really, there's some things that you don't want to say if you don't know. That's one of those things that I don't know why. I suppose, and this is a supposition, and you know what that supposing means, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's the, not going to make them. The best thing on that, it, it, if you could give them the example yeah, of where, where, where the property, the where's the, the property at, I, I, so oh, I know, but let's, let's get a physical address and find out why. I'm interested in that too. If a non-resident is, is paying less taxes than me, I want to know who and where the other way and why. It's the other way around. Okay. The other way around. I'm going to give you a, personally, perfect, a perfect example. I had a, my dog that lived in the, in the foothills at the Falls Resort, okay? Right. I know. So they built a house at the Falls, right? 
and we're paying personal property tax on that house. Mm -hmm. Come to find out that they were listed as non-residents in that property, okay? They went to the county and asked, they found out that they could get a refund because they're residents. They weren't non-residents. But if you look on the back of your tax, your tax thing, okay, it says residents pay this amount, non-residents will pay this amount, by percentage. My question is, why is that? I don't know. I really don't know. Because I didn't, I wasn't aware that that was the case. Is there, is there uh, some way we can find an answer to that? Oh, so. The assessor is an elected official. You can ask him. Uh, you know, he runs, the, the assessor runs, the treasurer runs the collection system, right? But the assessor assesses the taxes that you pay. Uh, so, if you have a question about why this thing is different, and if it says the Board of Supervisors can change that, then then it would be up in my alley. But at this particular point, I didn't even realize that a resident or a non-resident got different tax rates. You know, the Palms may have an answer for that. They, we may be assessing the uh, Palms more uh, because of their value, and then the people inside the Palms are paying for their property, and that may mean, well, I don't know, really, I shouldn't even, you know, I shouldn't even speculate. I do not know that. I'll try to find out. In Would you find out? Yeah, sure. I'll ask the question. We have, we have one more question because it's already after seven. Way after. <laughs> and we got Jerry's going to speak and a couple ladies going to speak also. Go ahead, sir. All right. Any other question? Can I get a softball? Yeah, a soft question. Like a soft thing. question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, real, real simple. School taxes. Yeah. School taxes. Uh, what about school taxes? Yeah, yeah. We don't set the rates, so yeah. I mean, it's going to be an easy one. I know, but you sign off on the budget, right? No. What we oh. do is this. By state law, any budget that the school districts submit to us, or the improvement districts, or the, you know, the library district we set, I shouldn't use the library district, but any district that, they will they set their own tax rate. We have to accept it and put it in the books. We don't have, get a chance to tell them, no, we think it's too high, we think it's too low. We don't do that. The state law doesn't allow us to do that. I did mention at the beginning of this conversation that we run everything by statute. The statute in that relative, relative to that, basically says you don't have the option of telling people what to charge. You only have the option of accepting and passing it on to the treasurer for collection. So the answer to your question is, if you have a problem with the tax rate in your school district, go to the school district board meeting mm -hmm. and make that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because of all the taxes you pay, the mm -hmm. highest ones normally go to the school districts, either AWC or, or the Jimmy Union High School. It's very difficult for me to become as old as I have and realize that I'm paying for the education of everybody else, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's kind of tough. But that's basically what happens when you get to a certain age and your kids are gone and they're in college and everything else and you're paying taxes <laughs> and the taxes, you're paying taxes to the school districts to keep kids that aren't yours. I do get that. And that is pretty tough. It, it, I'm in the same spot. Well, I know I'm not really. I have a 15-year-old. I went to Hawaii and instead of bringing up a pineapple, I brought a girl. Uh, my wife got pregnant. This wasn't a planned event. <laughs> so all the ideas I had about cruising and going down to, you know, I'm not going to conclude anymore. Because I think yeah, the world is name and takes a mess it up. But uh, other than that, no taxes for school district taxes. Uh, the, the school district set the tax, and we accept it and pass it on. We don't have uh, the authority as a board of supervisors to change that, to lower it or raise it. They send us what their tax rate is, and we put it in the books. The same thing with the city of Yuma or the city of San Luis or the city of Somerville who have property tax rates. The city of San Luis doesn't have a property tax rate, so they're not in that position, but they have enough improvement districts to make sure that their taxes are high. Um, so it's, it's the truth. If you look at your tax bill, you'll find 11 or 12 or 13 or 15 line items. Most of those line items are out of control. I'll find out what happened to residents and non-residents because I think that we may have something to say about that, but we don't have anything to say about the rates Right. Just pay. We just we just may be able to find out what's the deal with the resident and non-resident. I, I may be able to find out, so I'll try to do that for you, sir. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, Let's okay. give Mr. Reyes uh, a hand. I'll try to get through what I'm going to do. I'll answer that question. I'm taking the microphone just to make sure nobody uses it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me introduce uh, Gary Schneider. He's going to talk about, let me get my notes here. Yes, Gary, I'll take it. He's going to have some talking points on the recall of three school board uh, members of Gaston School District uh, number 32. Gary Schneider. Hello, everyone. 
glad to see all faces here and hope that you guys are healthy and safe. Um, good thing that we finished on uh, taxes for school boards. I live in uh, Tony Reyes district in San Luis, Arizona. I actually brought a gentleman, Hernando Soto, he's a new to the tea party right here. Um, he's also from uh, San Luis. We uh, came to talk about uh, something that's dear to my heart is education in San Luis. I've uh, been there since 2015. My mom's from Mexico. My dad's from the United States, born in uh, Seattle. Uh, in San Luis, we know we're at the port. Uh, a lot of education is urban. A um, lot, of, lot of kids living across the border, crossing to the United States to go to school. Uh, it's just much cheaper to live in Mexico. Um, the people that are living in San Luis itself, uh, our educational um, section, our Gaffney School District, uh, majority of the school members have been there for, give or take, 18, 22 years, like uh, Tony was talking about. Three of the ladies there have been there for combined about 40 years. So there's a good experience there, correct? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, since 2011, uh, they have dipped from a number low most of the time is very low. High is great. They're in the less than 25 percentile, and you see, okay, because we're at a border town. No, that's not correct. The budgeting and the school board itself has lost their focus. The number one focus is education, your teachers, and your employees. Um, this last two years, they went to Granado Island to, yes, San Diego, to the most expensive hotel. They racked up with the bill $65,000. Oh, so me as a taxpayer, yep. talking as a taxpayer, we in San Luis pay four taxes to the gas and school district and to the AWC. Yep. Okay, good. So from there, we also have our rights, correct? Mm -hmm. And obviously South County we know is Democrat or Republican. That shouldn't really matter. The point is here is the education of our children. I applaud the ladies for the educational experience that they've been there. Mm -hmm. The ladies itself have changed their heart and their point of view to govern the Gadsden School District. It is a new new age. Uh, they need modernization. And I'm recalling these three ladies because of the missed funds, the misuse, and the unfit worthiness that they are there. These three ladies have been involved in certain aspects that I will not announce, but uh, I've started the recall petitions that I've definitely in two days already taken a lot of uh, grief from them on their area on social media mm -hmm. towards my personal self, not towards the political part, but mm -hmm. towards the personal self. Uh, I would like to let them know and let you guys know that I'm almost done turning in the 1,237 uh, votes, signatures that needed to be to be turned in. But what I'm announcing to y'all is we're looking to help San Luis students, educators, in our town because educating these kids for the next generation will be a great prospect for Yuma County. Mm -hmm. Not just San Luis, but also through Summerton and Yuma, we'll have our next generation of possibly mayor, possibly a new uh, supervisor, possibly city council. That's our goal. Like Tony says, our next generation has been changed. Like you said, our next generation, we want to leave for an opportunity to be educated. Not the people right now that have been there for 20 years, 22 years, enjoying themselves with their you know, power in hand, and still worrying about the school board. So here, I'm just letting you know that I've started a recall for these three ladies that should be turned in within the next following weeks with the full lead signatures. That is our update for San Luis, Arizona. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Can you tell us her name? Oh yeah, I can tell you her name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one lady is Gloria Torres. Another lady, Guillermo Fuentes. And the third lady is Rosa Valera. Oh my God. Go ahead. Gary, uh, the ones that signed the petition, do they have to be uh, yes. yes. So I could have a recall, but I have two dozen residents, influential residents, 
summer IT educators in the Gaston School District that helped me obtain almost these 1,237 signatures that are registered voters and live in the Gaston School District. In our area, as Tony can tell you, there's an area that's a new annex area, which is one of the new hospitals. It's called Section F. They do not belong to the Gaston School District. Even though it's in San Luis, they belong to Somerton School District. It's a little weird, but that's how they annex it. There's no San Luis School District. It's going to Gaston and Somerton. Yeah, so they're on the other side of the street, which they can't vote, so they go to the Somerton School District. So we're on um, basically the main San Luis and Gaston is what the voters will be able to sign. Yes, right? I got a question. You said they spent $65,000 in the Coronado Motel. How come? <laughs> no, not, not the Coronado here in uh, you know. <laughs> But yes, in Coronado Island. Well, would there have been a better place in Gaston School to spend that $65,000? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that is definitely a, a for sure allocation of funds. Uh, they also, uh, from the AG state, they broke into an open act where there had to be the open, the open meeting law as well. That they didn't apologize for it either. They just accepted it and that was it. But yes, those funds could have been used maybe uh, to pay for, you know, better some teachers upgrades that have masters that are not even paid as they should be. Uh, maybe bring in some new teachers, uh, some new New employees, stuff like that. Go ahead. I heard their bus is in pretty bad shape too. Uh, yeah, they were they were needing a new bus, and unfortunately, those funds were used somewhere else. San Diego. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. Was there any effort to make them pay that back? Uh, well, they were taken to the AG. The AG did the conclusion, the analysis. They saw that. They spent the money, and then all they gave them was the opportunity to say the Open Meeting Act. <laughs> Basically, the meeting itself, the reason they went to Cornell Island, was to do a school board meeting, and it was supposed to be open, but it's supposed to be open in San Luis where other people could go. So to recap that, when the school board has a meeting, all the public can attend so they can make a judgment call if the school board is doing the proper thing for the kids. So they took it over to Coronado and had a vacation for $65,000 and didn't let any of the citizens of Gadsden attend it to be informed like we are being informed today. This you know, isn't the today. first time this has happened in yeah. Yuma. Uh, not too long ago, our own city of Yuma was hit by that by mm -hmm. going out of town for city business yeah. and we people of the United States uh Yuma City squash that idea yeah. they don't have anyway any more questions because we're getting late Sorry? You get paid good money. <laughs> so as me, I'm just giving you just give you guys an update. Our jail is in Tony's district and we want the best for, for our kids and our community, and especially where taxpayers. That's what's important. Thank you. Mr. Kerry Snyder, ladies and gentlemen. Moving right along. May 1st. We're in the streets again, ladies and gentlemen. May 1st. May 1st. It's a Saturday. We haven't set up the time yet, but I'm hoping I can convince Carl let's do this about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock. I want to be on my motorcycle. You know what I'm saying? But it's going to be in support of our military because May is uh, Memorial Day month. The month of May is Memorial Day. So we want to uh, show uh, support to our military, our law enforcement, our local, federal, and state law enforcement. We'll have our banners, we'll have our flags. Please, uh, how many of you are going to be here May 1st? I know we have a lot of snowbirds here. And if you guys are here, that would, we would love to see the support. And uh, uh, moving right along, uh, May 1st, uh, like I told, like I said, I want to Mid morning, so we show the support. And again, I, I enjoy supporting our uh, local mayor because he does a lot for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the motorcycle community and our Tea Party, uh, he allows us uh, to be able to do what we do. 
You know, anytime I say, hey, Mayor, I'm going to do this, he always, thank you for the, uh, the heads up, and we're good to go. So, uh, anything for the good of the Lord? Is there any organization that wants to, um, Mr. Carl? I don't have an organization, but I would really like to thank Carl as a way to me today, because this lady, she does a lot for us, and all the happy stuff. I got, a, I got a question, you all. Mainly you snowbirds, because you guys are up there in age like me. How many of you heard of grapefruit pie? We got one guy. I said the same thing. You gotta be joking. It was good. Carla made me a grapefruit pie. I mean, she does all those bills back there, the cookies and stuff. Carla's the one that does them. Yet, uh, earlier this week, she made me a blueberry pie sugar-free. I enjoyed it. So anything good in the order? I saw that on Facebook. Yeah, I saw it right here. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I've got a question. Uh, I have an answer. Last meeting, we had... Uh, Daniel Woods? Yeah, and we signed petitions to uh, oust some people. Yes. Uh, what's come of that, and are we still? We have them right back there. Are we still I, I, to get yes, 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 we are. are and we they're, they're back there. Neighborhood walks or anything? They they've done that. We were there yesterday at our Fourth uh, Avenue, Twenty Fourth Street rally. We had petitions out there, and there are a couple of ladies going out uh, around in the neighborhoods collecting uh, petitions. Okay, I'd like to know more on the neighborhood mm -hmm. walk. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes ma'am. Oh, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I'm from Washington, but yes. I'm down here trying to uh, support the audit the vote. And I'm wondering if the Tea Party is doing anything to help with that, because that is an issue that affects every state. And I haven't seen the Tea Party doing anything yet. Well, maybe your eyes have been closed. <laughs> <laughs> we are, actually, I have Richard come into our next meeting. Uh, Steven Richardson. Steven. Steven is coming. Steven. The yeah, project, the Arizona project, the Ford project, and voting. We haven't come in now uh, at our next meeting. Oh, nice. Yeah, we haven't. Nice. Next, question. Yeah, excellent question. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, because we started. How many new uh, uh, visitors do we have today? Show of hands. All right. I like this. Thank you very much. I'm going to embarrass you. Where? You guys. It's my time now. Your name's up. Dick Copeland. Where are you from, Dick? Keith in Washington. Washington. How long are you here for? Just till the 5th of April now. Oh, good. We'll see you in May. Where else are we here? Back here. I know I had uh, two ladies come up to me and talk to me earlier, and I didn't know you guys off, but I just forgot. Okay, great. Thank you. Veronica, how are you? Well, I'm from Colorado, but I'm here permanently. Good. Yes. Can you Carol? Yes, sir. Genaro Soto. I was born in Salvaripa, and I live in uh, San Luis, Arizona. I'm well represented by Mr. Tony, and I'm uh, thank you, uh, Gary, for inviting me to this beautiful meeting. Thank you, sir. Hi. Right behind you, grab it. I got it. I'm going to help you out from Ohio, and uh, I want to thank the guy who called uh, Russ Clark this morning and left a message that there'd be a meeting here tonight. Well, there's two of us. <laughs> Mr. Carl, Carl Kaiser. Yeah. He's the one that did that. Yeah, Actually, he wanted to get me. He came looking for you. Can I ask one thing? You have a business directory. I meet all over town, but I'd like to support places that uh, there's some after the meeting. I'll let you know. All right. Jimmy K says Foothills. <laughs> I wonder why. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Oh, yes, ma'am. I just have a question. Yes, ma'am. I understood that Daniel Wood spoke last week. We yes, ma'am. And that he was going to maybe come back. Yes, ma'am. So is he scheduled? Can we count on that? Because we're leaving April 15th, so we better be. 
All right. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. I know April 15th, I have Phil Townsend, who is president of the school board. You're going to be talking to us. So that's April 15th. I'm getting my calendars filled up. Anything else to do to the order? Back there again? No. Okay. It, oh, yes. Come on, Edgar. Yes, yes. <clears throat> She got some pretty good information for those of you got to carry your cell phones everywhere. Yeah. You don't want to be detected. Here you go. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tony, and this is Arlene. And we wanted to show you our, our uh, okay. encrypted yeah. Thank you. safe cell phones. Mm -hmm. And why can you turn the volume mic on? The mic is not on. Oh, I just talked low. Well. Sorry. I can talk about it. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, with the phone right back there. Oh, good. But uh, this is the clear phone, and it's encrypted, and all your data is saved to you. Oh, wow. And um, none of your information goes up in the cloud unless you want to use an app like Facebook or something like that, and, and unless you want to use their apps. But these are awesome. They're only $40 a month. They're in nine different countries right now, and they've just been introduced to the United States about four months ago. And you know what, I'm not very techie, so she's more. Well, I'm not that techie yet on this because this is new to me too, but um, listening to the videos that they provide, the company has been working towards this for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. So they put a lot of thought into helping us be free. It's got a better camera than an iPhone. This yep. has got eight apertures where your iPhone's got four. Can, can you explain to them why you're uh, pushing this thing because they can't track you? Is that right, what right. Because I didn't hear that. And I want to be in charge of my own data. I don't want the companies and everybody else having the data. And we, it should be our data. Our information should be kept in our home. Is that unlimited? Excuse me? Is it unlimited? Yes, yes. It's run by T-Mobile. We have two different models here. Mm -hmm. This this is what they call a 620. It's the larger one. It's about seven inches plus long. And you have the 220. 220. And then there's a one in the middle, a 420. You don't mm -hmm. have to remember the numbers, but she's got the small and I got the large. What's the difference between that and the Clear United. We are yeah, we are gonna have a meeting on Saturday at 3 30, this coming Saturday at 3 30 where People that are more techy than me, which doesn't take a lot, but um, then we'll be able to explain more about this phone, the technical part. You might also want to look into Pine Phone and Linux Phone. Yeah. Linux. Who made this Linux behind us? This is Where are you guys having your meeting and stuff? It depends on how many people want to sign up to come to the meeting, where the location is going to be. It could be in my business or it could be in a larger facility. It could be. Is that US made, China made, Taiwan? No, nothing in China. It was made in, in New Zealand. The patent, or, I'm sorry. the patent is in New Zealand because patents there are secured. Patents in the US get stolen. Yeah. It was made in New Zealand, yeah. designed in Italy, developed in India, secured in Canada, supported in the US and the UK. But it is assembled somewhere in China. Yeah. But no parts from China. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, so, we don't need to sign up tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Sign up tonight, okay. and we'll get back to you on the location okay. so, of our meeting on Saturday. T-Mobile is the only carrier. We got a question over here first, please. What? Um, so when we first came to to Yuma, I asked uh, the realtor, you know, what what carrier is good, and she said Verizon is the only thing that works in Yuma. That's so is T-Mobile does that work good? Yes. You got I used up to Yes, I use T-Mobile. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not very techy, and I'm very happy with how I've been able to use this. And the problem is, is uh. Depends where you're at, where you yeah. work at. Yeah. Where I worked at before, uh, mobile didn't work very well. The only thing that worked out where I worked at was uh, Verizon. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. yeah, I just wondered if T-Mobile was the only. No, AT&T, Verizon. Yeah, you can. You can. Okay, if you guys have more questions, it work. Sure. 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 No, 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 just this. From this company. From this company. Yeah, mine, mine was $499. Ooh. You can do it close 
cheaper than an iPhone, right? And you can do 12 months free uh, interest financing. Or 24. Or 24, yeah. yeah. And, and mine was a lot more because I love photography and the, the photography part of it is a little more enhanced. I was going to go to the Apple 12, but I went this way instead. It costs a little more, but I went over 24 months. And um, it was 60, 60 something, under $70, 60 some dollars a month I'm paying for this in service. Yeah. And it's $40 a month for the actual phone. Okay. I was paying $172 for my two items. Yeah. If you guys need to uh, sign up, she has some sign up sheets here. Yeah. So, <clears throat> can I get a motion to adjourn this meeting? Okay. Uh, motion got a second. Any discussion? Yes. None, seeing none, all favor say aye. 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 Oh, all right, thank you very much.